Today I have a mystery video item that most people probably have never seen and never unless owned because this was a really expensive piece of equipment in its day. Here's something you don't see much anymore. This is a GoCo video system. And what this is, is this is a, a TC20 Telecine player. This was uh, around back in the 1980s and uh, I paid a lot of money for this thing. This this piece of equipment that's sitting here was, I think it was two grand, 2,500 bucks. It was not cheap. This was um, used to transfer Super 8 home movie film to video. And it's not a camera, as you might think this is a camera, but this is actually not. This is just a telecine player. You see on the back side of this is a big lens and you put your professional camera up against this. So this actually went into a, a professional camera like a three tube or a three chip. Well, they were three tubes at the time. Um, Sony uh, DXC uh, M3 for example, or D I used the DXC 1800 single tube uh, uh, Satacon tube uh, camera is what I was using with this unit. The unit itself still works, it's just it's kind of obsolete and there are, there are better systems. The only reason I hang on to this thing is because it does sound. And I use the, uh, I use the, Wol the Wolverine single transfer HD scanner now which does one frame at a time in HD. And um, which is fine but it only works with silent movies and it's very slow but the quality is good and then if I have a sound movie I'll take the film and I'll, I'll rerun it through this machine here just to get the sound off of it and record the sound. Um, quality wise this was this was good it was it was one of the best systems that we had for optically transferring Super 8 films. They actually made another one that was just as expensive as this that was only for standard 8 and um, I had one of those as well but I, I sold that one many moons ago and only hung on to this one. I actually had this one for sale but nobody bought it. I, I sold the 8mm which did not do sound it was just just did it just did the, uh, the, the film but it did it very similar to this. What makes these things unique is how they how they worked and what we're going to do on this video is I'm going to take this thing apart so you guys can see what's in it and uh, show you guys how it works and what, what made this thing unique over, as a, over say just using a projector. So under here is the lamp and it's a 6 volt 10 watt 2.5 amp incandescent bulb and the, the bulb is shot on this one but there's the little bulb it looks like it's got air in it and it just say just used a six volt 10 watt um, light and the light would shine through this little opaque type of this is what made the light um, flat so I could probably put an LED in place of this thing but if, if we look through this this lens it looks foggy and that's because this is to diffuse the light. And then the film travels through on this gate here. If I put the knob back on <clears throat> so I can show you what it does. So when you thread the film, you pull the film through here. It's got a, a pinch roller on here, a capstan and a pinch roller. When you lower down the gate, you can see the sprocket, which this is just used to synchronize and what there is is there's a prism that is below here and I'll take this apart so you guys can see it so basically when you put it into play the motor is spinning capstan and the pinch roller now will pull the film through at a constant rate this is the head for the sound for magnetic sound if you've got a sound film and the film is pulled through at a constant rate just like a tape recorder and as the film is pulled through this spins and this synchronizes a prism that's underneath here. So let's um, let's take the prism apart so you guys can see what is uh, on the prism.
You would wonder why in the world these things cost so much money, but they were precision engineered and not very high volume. But there is the there's the prism. Oh, look at that. It's broken. This wouldn't work if I wanted it to. The prism has actually come detached. It needs to be glued back down. But this is this is the prism here. Now when this when the film is pulling through here, you see this wheel turns like that. And this prism was normally glued on there. You can see where the glue has let go. But what this is, is this is a 24 faceted prism. And if you look through here, you'll see as it turns, you can always see directly below. What it does is as the film passes over top, this rotates at the same rate that the film is going. So as the film is turning, as the film is moving, this is moving in the same direction that the film is moving. And it allows the frames to follow or scan the actual uh, frame itself. So uh, you've got a framing control. The framing control, uh, where is it here? One's the focus, and this is the framing control. And what the framing control does is the framing control, as you can see, if I hold the gear, the framing control changes the actual phase of this gear, this wheel, as it's turning. So that it'll line up with the actual frame of film. So each one of these facets will have a frame of film directly over top. The light shining through it, it of course, will go straight through and come out the other side. If you look through this, you'll see if I rotate it, if I get it lined up here with the camera, if I rotate it, you'll see what happens. that so so what that does is that synchronizes the film that's moving with the light plane so that what appears on the camera is a steady image for the entire length of the, the frame the scan time and then as the next frame pops into place course the light that's passing through the, the prism as the prism moves the next one jumps into place and your next frame appears instantly there's no shutter it's a constant light source there's no shutter and what you get on the film is a very good image and this was as good as it got for super 8 transfers this was right up there with uh, some of those flying spot uh, units that were out that used a little CRT and actually had a flying spot that would track that would that would track the image on the film. Uh, the flying spot was did a slightly better job, but the fact that you could use this with a broadcast camera, a three tube camera, um, gave this one the edge in color quality. It was very good, and to say it was it was expensive. Now you say I'm going to have to get some glue and glue this back on now that I see that it's that it's fallen off. I'm gonna have to glue that back on and see if I can get this thing to work. So let's take the rest of the knobs off here and I'm gonna pull this front off so you can see what's underneath here. And then maybe we'll see if I can glue this thing back on. That would be nice. Not that I plan to use this thing, but no point putting it away if it's broken. So if we look down here on the unit itself, it's got a drive belt that drives from the motor, that drives the, the capstan shaft. Actually, there's probably two drive belts. There's another, there's a belt that turns, obviously, there's a belt that, that turns the uh, take-up spool. But there's a drive belt here, turns it midway pulley, which will turn another belt, which turns the take-up side, and also turns the capstan. But you notice here that there's, a, there's a, an FG hull effect sensor um, that generates a frequency from this little magnet that's on the motor and that's used to control the speed 
it's a speed um, servo motor. You also notice that there's some mirrors down here. These get dirty. These have to be cleaned from time to time. But what happens is, as you can see here, here's our light path. Here's our focusing lens here. It adjusts the focusing lens. The light shines down through the film, which shines down through this prism, which is normally attached on here like that. And as this prism spins, the light transgress transgresses down through a frame right here. Through the lens, it hits mirror number one here, which reflects the light at uh, 90 degrees to the right, where it hits mirror number two, which reflects the, the light 90 degrees to the back. And then there's two more mirrors in the back, one that reflects the light up towards the the uh, macro lens, and then another one that reflects the light out the back. As you can imagine, with all these mirrors on a unit like this, setup was an absolute nightmare. So I had a, I actually had a, a piece of um, of uh, aluminum machined that the machine sat in, and it had a base for my camera that my camera would actually just fit right into. I'd, I'd screw the camera down, like with the with the, ba the the tripod mount, and then I would set this machine into this little base that would hold it in the exact position because if you're off by even a couple of millimeters, you'd have a dark image on the top corner of the screen or a dark image on the bottom or, you know, or your colors would shift slightly if you weren't exactly true. It was, uh, it was an absolute nightmare. And I always, I often thought about putting a CCD camera inside and just presetting it underneath the lens here, but I never got around to that. Um, that actually might be a project. That might be something worth checking into, see if I can put a camera in here directly below, uh, inside here, that could focus directly on the film frame itself. That might be a project for another day. But um, anyway, let's uh, see how I get some glue mixed up and we'll reattach this. Okay, that's put back together. I just used some five minute epoxy, just a little bit on there to let that uh, set up. We'll give it a few minutes to set up, and then I'll put the back, put the front back on it, and we'll take the back off the unit and look at the back side of it. And maybe someday down the road, I'll actually put a film in here, and uh, we'll uh, we'll show it off. I'm thinking whether I, how I'm going to go about doing that because I don't have the jig anymore to 
to align the camera. But uh, may be able to work something out just to do a little short little transfer to, to show what the quality looked like off this unit by comparison to um, what the quality looks like off of my Wolverine, which there'll be no there'll be no comparison in the quality. I actually recently found the bill for this thing um, when I bought it, and it was—I think it was two thousand bucks. It was either two thousand or twenty-five hundred. I forget. It was a lot. It was a lot of money. I couldn't—I couldn't believe how much money I spent on this thing. Although I was doing—I was doing film transfer work for um, three photo labs, so I did very like very high volume. Uh, film transfers for three retail photo labs of the day and I was picking up you know back in the 80s I would pick up probably you know four or five thousand feet of film every day it was crazy it was when when, when everybody was on the transfer your home movies to VHS when that was happening back in the uh, the late 80s mid to late 80s and into the 90s it was uh, it was crazy I'd go you know I'd, I it was just the amount of film that I went through was uh, that was I would say that was probably easily that was 60% uh, if not more of my entire production business at the time was film I had this for Super 8, and I had another one for 8mm, and I had, I, there was days where I'd have them both running at the same time. I'd be doing one person's Super 8 films on one system, and I was doing 8mm films on another system. With two separate VCRs hooked up, and uh, two cameras hooked up, and two monitors. It was, uh, it was crazy. Crazy times. How times have changed. Now, I'm lucky to get, you know, 50 or 100 feet of film a month to transfer over to, uh, to digital. I still get the odd one, but not a lot. Like the people that have got the really big orders aren't paying someone else to do it. You know, if they've got more than 500 bucks worth of film to transfer, uh, they're going to go buy their own um, Wolverine system and do it themselves. They're not going to. I don't know if I have to take those ones out or not. I'm going to leave those ones in. I wouldn't want to take out something and have mirrors fall off inside it. Yep, yeah, there we go. Oh, good thing I didn't take those screws out. They have mirrors on them. That would be messy if I took those out. I'd have mirrors falling all over the place inside. But here's the inside of the box. As you can see, there's there is some stuff in here. Got the motor. We've got the gears for the timing. These are the gears that, that spin the prism. The light source is up here. Here's the gears that spin the prism. Motor. There's a flywheel in here. There's a little uh, servo circuit down in here. There's a little preamp for the sound transformer in the back here. And. Um, there's another look. the inner workings, a couple circuit breakers up here. And here's the the flywheel motor. Inside the back here, here's what uh, 
reflects the light. So they got a mirror here. These are first surface mirrors, by the way, as opposed to second surface. A first surface mirror has the silver coating right on the surface of the glass, as opposed to on the back side of the glass. So you don't get the refraction of the glass. You get a nice clear reflection, as you can see when I'm reflecting there, the lights. Second, first surface um, mirror here, and a frame. That's what you're focusing the camera on is that. And a macro lens, of course. So that's what's uh, inside the box. Here's the the right side power inlet. It has a speed selector 18 or 24 frames and you can adjust the speed up or down. It has a, a indent for the correct speed but you can go up or you can go down to compensate for cameras that operated at a different speed. The standard speed of course for Super 8 was 18 frames for silent. If you shot sound you could shoot it at 18 or 24. Made in Japan, and it says here in brackets, Kawasaki. Interesting. Is there a serial number on that thing? Oh yeah, it's engraved on here. 262001. Hmm, I don't think they sold that many of these things, but who knows. Anyway, that's... That's the Goko Video System Vintage optical telecine with the no flicker 24 system this is the this is what they 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 prided this system on was that that prism the non flicker system 24 faceted side to the to the prism and uh, that was their claim to fame to say it, it did a good job it was bloody expensive but anybody who was in the business of the time had one of these things because uh, for doing high volume work this was the only way to do it. Hope you guys enjoyed this look at this vintage old thing. And now I can go put this thing back into storage until the next time I need to do a sound film. Thanks for watching.